Yep, got it. Well, okay, guys. So I want this is a presentation on patient provider communication going beyond uh, the differential. So I really want some feedback, some interactions. I don't want to just talk. I really prefer not to. So with that said, here are the objectives. We need to understand the link between compliance and communication and um, patient outcomes. Dr. Hayes, I will send you, I'll send everyone a copy of the presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, goal, the goal is to demonstrate the importance of knowing support services, because as physicians, I feel like a lot of times we don't know all of the patient support services that are out there that can help our patients be more compliant. So we'll talk about that um, and really easy free ways that you can get these resources to them. Um, understanding the importance of health education and literacy. And then the last goal is to teach physicians how to maximize the support for patients compliance. So we're gonna start by talking about the HPV vaccinations. What do you guys know about the HPV vaccination? What's the guidelines for it presently? I, I'm, I'm actually talking to the room here. What are the guidelines for getting the HPV vaccination presently? Giorgio, Dr. Hayes, Dr. Stein. I know the European guidelines. I don't know the okay, American. so what are the European guidelines? Uh, basically, it's not compulsory, but it's suggested to every uh, adolescent, but, and it's free for every teenage girl uh, under 18. So after 18, they're not allowed to, you're not to give no, the no, vaccine? No, I, I don't remember the threshold, but yeah, usually it's free for uh, age girls. Okay. So um, in the United States, the guideline is basically that um, you, you want the patient to take it as an adolescence between 11 and 16, because at between 11 and 12, it's only two shots. And after, after, tw after 14, it's three shots. Um, but we can still give women this vaccination after the normal um, window of vaccination, as long as she is tested negative twice for HPV. Even if she's tested positive previously, she can now take it even after being tested positive, as long as she's had two negative HPV that, uh, HPV tests. Um, so that's really important to know because previously, especially in the United States, it was there was a 26 year old cutoff. That cutoff no longer exists. So it's it's a means of prevention uh, for even the older populations that didn't get it previously. Um, so these are just a couple of facts about um, HPV that I'm sure we all know, but the whole point is, is, is that HPV vaccination is to prevent a more serious illness. And it's an illness that most women don't even know they have. They, women walk around asymptomatic until they don't. And then if we're not testing regularly, especially with the present United States guidelines that say, if you have a normal pap smear year one, then you don't need another one for three to, you know, three to five years, depending on your age. And it, the, that number gets higher as you get older. And we have an entire generation in the United States that didn't qualify for the HPV vaccination that are now qualified. So we're hoping to get the numbers down. Um, these are the uh, different uh, HPV types that can cause cancer or warts, which either way are quite uncomfortable and causes a lot of pain to females. These are the contradictions and precautions that you're supposed to stipulate to your patients in trying to get them to take the vaccine. Right now we're in a anti-vax kind of community. So can you guys give me some examples on how you would uh, try to support a positive decision and acceptance of the vaccine for a patient who might not be sure or said no previously? <clears throat> well, you would just educate them on what the uh, results would be if they didn't get it. Sometimes explaining the mechanism of action of the vaccine can help. 
Okay. So those two are really good ideas. Um, also addressing the stigma. So knowing who you're talking to. So if you're talking to a Muslim woman who just brought her daughter or her son in, who might think that by giving my child this vaccine, I'm basically consenting them to have sex. How do you address that? Not very successfully. <laughs> well, I mean, there are ways to address the cultural, the cultural and religious aspects that we do have to consider when we're having these conversations with our patients. So for any, you know, very conservative religious family, we do have to talk about the fact that this vaccine doesn't give her consent to have sex. It doesn't protect her from all the other diseases. And as a matter of fact, we don't even have to tell her, the minor, that this is something that has anything to do with sex. We can just say this is a vaccine to protect them from cancer, which is really what the vaccine is. Yeah, it, is. it just so happens that this virus is caught by having intimacy. So you then remove the stigma from the, pa from the parent allowing them to be a little bit more open-minded. Does that, does that make kind of sense to everybody? Yes. Sense, yep. um, you know. No, what's your feedback, Dr. Stein? Well, I, you know, it's a dancing act with families. I mean, they not, may not even have enough time, but um, I think saying that, you know, one thing you can say, it protects her from uh, rape, from if she gets raped and there's a disease there, but um, this, is, this is the art of medicine, basically, <laughs> you're talking about. And yeah, it has a lot of you and how you're comfortable and what you can present. Um, I, had I, a patient, I had a patient with ADD who wouldn't take the medicine during Ramadan. You know, I mean, you, things get in the way. Uh, I think your uh, suggestion about cancer is wonderful. Yeah, I mean that that's that's kind of the idea of this whole presentation is to kind of let's discuss you know ways that we can help each other to better communicate with our patients because sometimes it's something as simple as we just didn't get out of our own heads to be able to figure out how to better communicate. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the underlining uh, objective of today. So I really hope you guys continue to engage. So here's so some I would, I would tie that together with all the other vaccinations they have to get, you know? Maybe. Yes, exactly. And also like just addressing addressing all of the gorillas and elephants in the room. I, I, Georgia, I don't know if you guys have uh, the same vaccination stigma in Italy as there has been here in the United States. That was all started by what has since and long been discredited report about the connection between vaccinations and autism. Um, and because social media is what it is, it has continuously resurfaced and kept perpetuating this fear. So it, nine times out of 10, you spend most of your time trying to convince them of what is not true. And, and as physicians, when we are told that we're on a timetable, sometimes it can be, it can be frustrating and you just kind of want to get to the point and get them to understand and just say yes. But there's ways that we can, can finesse it. And as Dr. Science so eloquently said, um, it's the art. This is the art of medicine. This is the part that's the art. Um, but these are six reasons why, you know, you should get the HPV. Things that we all know, and we probably have told patients over and over again, but use these six points and then augment them to fit the interaction that you have with your patient. Because sometimes there'll be cultural differences, religious differences, um, community belief differences, and you have to understand how those all play a part in their health behavior. And you know, always inviting, like one of the best parts about my experience with Dr. Bernard and, and this practice is watching how people brought their loved ones. And it was very open for the loved ones to participate in the history giving as well as participate in like describing symptoms because we don't always see ourselves the way the rest of the world sees us and, and having that extra opinion or insight does help us. And the same thing can be said about the influence and confounding factors that affect our, our patient's behavior. And we need to understand that and kind of consider that. 
This is uh, from John Hopkins. These are the reasons why uh, parents refuse. So this was from 2006 and 2010. So I have a couple of questions here. How would you, how would you guys address some of these reasons? Can you see them or do you need me to read them out loud? Would you please? Okay, so the first one says for girls, 23% said uh, parents refuse due, due to safety. 20% um, lack of necessity, 13% lack of knowledge, and this is just for girls. 10% abstinence of physical, uh, abstinence of physician recommendation, and then 10% assumed not sexually active. And then there, for boys, there was a gender necessity, which I thought was interesting because for all intents and purposes, I, I know I've convinced a couple of parents that had boys, um, because I am a mother of two boys as, as well, is that HP, men do get HPV. HPV is transmitted from a man to a woman. So if your son is not circumcised, he's actually carrying it. So why not, you know, protect him from his risk of getting penile cancer, as well as decrease the spread of the virus altogether. When you put it in that type of terminology, it then makes sense why this came up, but also how we can debunk it as, as a group, right? So that's what I mean. Like, how would you address some of these issues, whether it's a parents of girls or parents of boys? Let's hear some of your comments. Well, is, the so of cervical, sorry. So sorry about the dogs. A lot of cervical cancer in this country. Um, let's see. 33,000 33, cancer diagnoses uh, last year. And cervical, last year, cervical cancer killed 311,000 women. No, you know, it's tough. How are you going to, you talk about cervix to families, it's going to be a tough one. Yes, but you, you, when you're talking to parents of boys, you don't talk about cervix. You talk about the penile cancer. You talk about the um, stenosis of the urethra that can happen. You also consider the fact of, depending on who you're talking to and what their cultural background is and what their community beliefs are, discuss how they could be affecting their community as a whole. For example, disproportionately minority women die more readily from cervical cancer. So if you're talking to a Hispanic, Black, or Asian family, maybe you bring that up. Or if you're talking to a family that doesn't circumcise their sons and in understanding that, you can help them understand how they would be making a positive effect on their community. So this is how you change the conversation, but keep it within what it's going to long short-term and long-term effects. In the Islamic culture, I think you talk to the imam first. You work with the guy, the guy in charge. They respect him much more than they respect you. Absolutely. Well, that may be true. And I would agree with that if we were talking about a community-based program. But if you're just dealing with a patient for the first time, this these are just some ways that you can deal with them on a one-to-one. -one. If you see them once and probably never see them again and help them understand how to, why this vaccine is so important. What about you, Dr. Hayes? How would you pick one of these and see, let me know what you would say to kind of. Well, I've always had a great success in talking to people who have actually experienced these things and not necessarily medical providers, just someone who has basically benefited from the vaccine from the community that that they come from. I think that would be effective. Yeah, absolutely. Because for every one man that gets that vaccine, they're saving at least four to six women's cervixes. I mean, if that's yes. how you want to put it, that's the way. Like I did research when I was in Barbados. Uh, I did a case study on the prevalence of HPV in countries that are that have high populations of circumcision versus populations that don't have high circumcision rates. And the populations with low circumcision rates or no circumcision rates, especially in um, you know, the Caribbean, which is where I was doing most of the research, 
their rates of cervical cancer were substantially higher above the global average. So there's something to be said about getting rid of this gender necessity part of this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just something, food for thought, just figured I'd bring it up. Um, clearly I'm biased. I like women's health a lot. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the timeline in the United States for uh, vaccination. So if they're over 14, so I stand corrected, I said 11, it's 14, then it's three shots. And then after 15, it's three shots. But as you can see, now this number is 45, where several years ago, it was 26 when the, when the shot first came out. So um, all you got to do is make sure your patient especially if you are in, in OB or doing, you know, family medicine, if the patient just delivered and previously tested positive for HPV and has delivered within 18 months, I say retest her because you might be able to get her that vaccine uh, before she gets reinfected. So if these are, because for whatever reason, it's been found that after delivery, because of the whole restart and shedding of the entire system, women tend to not be positive anymore. So you then have the opportunity to give them the vaccine and protect that population. Mm -hmm. So another reason why to uh, understand and be able to communicate uh, appropriately with your patients. So what if your patient says, I need some time to think about it. What do you do? Give them a few YouTube channels to look at. <clears throat> Give them some pamphlets to look at. Okay, yeah. Or, or videos. There are many videos out there. CDC um, has tons of videos, tons of videos. Mm -hmm. I always love to give out the CDC videos because although now in the United States, CDC videos are a little shaky. So I tried Planned Parenthood. March of Dimes also has videos. Um, you can even go to the pharmaceutical company themselves and they tend to have videos as well. Um, sometimes they're more commercially, but... These are all the different ways that you can um, provide them with information. Also, um, there's medical, medical, medical education uh, websites like Osmosis on YouTube that also has really good uh, videos um, on the topic of vac HPV vaccination and cervical cancer so that if they need more time to like view it and maybe get some more understanding, those are also options. Um, also free on YouTube, doesn't cost the patient anything. So how long do you normally give a patient to comp contemplate whether they wanna come back for it? Do you set up a follow-up visit right then and there or do you call back? What would be your practices? If you're practicing neurology or family medicine and you have so much to do, I'm not sure you have time in reality to have them come back for a discussion. I really don't. I mean, these people are all terribly busy. I, I, I just think the reality is very difficult. I, would, I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing, Dr. Stein, and I was in this, I was did my family medicine rotation and this woman has her own practice. And the way she handled contemplation is that she would immediately set them up for an appointment a week later. And during that appointment, it was, you know, let's rediscuss the shot. Let's give you some shots. So like, if, if this is like, for example, this is flu season. Mm -hmm. And um, so she would say, oh, we'll give you the COVID this week. While you think about HPV, we'll hold off on the flu shot. So they, one, they have a reason to come back. And two, you have another opp opportunity to discuss the HPV vaccination. So there's ways that we as physicians can do it. And yes, it does make our practices more busy, but it is all about making our patients healthier, or at least that's my belief, or I try. Um, so that's that's one way. Or you know, you have nurse practitioner or uh, office manager follow up with them a week later or a couple of days later to see if they want to reset the appointment for the HPV vaccination. Um, How about give them the information? before they come in for their appointment. So that way they're well informed and then they can go ahead and get the shot. So that goes back to Dr. Stein's point. People are busy. If we give that to them, the likelihood, at, at least for this family medicine practice, they tried that idea. They had exactly your idea and they tried it. Patients weren't reading them. 
Ah. It wasn't until they were in front of the doctor or in front of the MP that they, that, and, and kind of faced with the decision, did they ask the questions? So then you can give them the appropriate information, they can read it, and then you follow up. And like Dr. Stein said, most doctors don't have time to sit there and call their patients back, but they have office managers, they have MPs that can do that or follow up, you know, email that you send out as a timer on a timer, which you can do, which I didn't even know you could, but this doctor showed me that, she, that you could, and that's how she does it. Um, Let me give you some lousy cut feedback, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, there, um, a million Americans have died from uh, COVID, and you are peddling HBO, uh, you know, their vaccine. Why aren't you putting your energy into saving more lives with COVID? I mean, I, you, I understand what you're saying, but the big picture in my head is, okay, that's not as important as saving a million lives. So I, I, I'm going to you know, well, challenge you well, with that. I, and, and I completely understand what you're saying. COVID does did take more lives than World War I, II, and the Vietnam War. I do understand that. And that is an important vaccine to get, which is also important to discuss with your patients. But this conversation can be applied to any vaccine. So it's not this... I used HPV as, as, as an example, but to get our patients to comply with the vaccination regulations is actually a lot harder than people would like to believe. And it's because there's so much misinformation. And my presentation here is really to discuss how we can better engage our patients, provide them with the information, what we should do as physicians to keep the conversation open and move them in a direction of vaccination. Because you could apply that to chickenpox, you could apply this conversation to MMR, you can apply this conversation to the flu shot, you can apply this conversation right. to the COVID shot. This conversation can be applied to any vaccination schedule that you can think of. This is just, I just happened to pick HPV. Well, but, but basically you're talking about a generic approach for all these required vaccinations. You know, I mean, uh, what do you do with it? A, might not be, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily generic because you have to adjust based on who you're talking to. Because I'm not giving you a blanket. I'm not giving you bullet points as, as to exactly what to say. I'm saying here are some bullet points to consider when you're talking to your patient. Here are some resources that you can use, things to think about when you're talking to patients. Because the conversation isn't going to be the same with every patient. I, I have yet to have a generic conversation with a patient ever. No, no. <laughs> the principles of, the principles of persuading somebody. Uh, in reality, nurse practitioner, for example, in diabetes, the nurse practitioner does most of the teaching. You know, I don't think the doctors have much time. Um, I'm just saying, for reality of life, of practice, you know, you. People are seeing me in 15 minutes. They're lucky to be seen 15 minutes at a time. And the American medical system is horrible. And you are wonderfully idealistic. <laughs> I appreciate that. But the question is, how do you make it work in the real world? You know, you have a wonderful doctor. But that's one, you know. Um, I sound like I'm being really pe pessimistic, but I'm trying to be realistic. Well, you know? I under I completely understand your, your um, opinion. And I realized that, yes, the system is very broken and the system is exactly what it is, where if you work for a macro system and you work within the confines of the 15 minutes and you're supposed to see 30 patients a day. And right, yeah. I understand that, but there's ways that you, you can learn how to work around it. And personally for me, I plan on just doing residency and opening up a private practice. So I have no intention to be sending just 15, 15 minutes with my patients. More importantly, I, I'm not um, under the impression that I can't get someone to talk to me or listen to me if I approach them in a manner that is at their level rather than at them. Let me give you so, some more painful information. Private mm -hmm. practice, um, an OB spends uh, over $100,000 for malpractice insurance. You have to pay for rent and staff. And the question is you have to then figure out how many patients do I have to see to stay alive? I mean, it's really, it's painful reality, unless you work for a place like Kaiser or something where they take care of everything. But in private practice, you can't, it's hard to afford, to afford all the dollars 
who are, you know, to have plenty of time to talk to patients. I'm, I'm just saying that's the reality. It's painful, it's terrible. So the best you can do, I think, is to get a, a, fit, a physician assistant, somebody who doesn't cost as much as your time to do that kind of work. Or you can say- this is I what agree that that person does need to exist within my system, yeah. thinking, but at the same token, I still need to be able to communicate with my patients and they still need to trust me in an effort to make a decision because bottom line is, yeah, they're going to trust my NP too. But when we're talking about a football team, I'm the quarterback. I'm the one that they're going to end up suing first. So if I don't have a rapport with them, whether it's for 15 minutes or 15 seconds, it doesn't matter what I say. What it's you say, Dr. Be- Nad, Dr. Bernard does not take a salary. Okay. If he did, he probably continued. He couldn't do what he's doing. Okay, his practice of medicine almost as a hobby. Okay, so you can't, as wonderful as it is, you can't take that as an example of what it has to be. You know. Well, I, I don't, I don't, I wasn't using his practice as an example, um, but I appreciate your input. It's, um, it's painful. You know, it's really painful. Did I show you the video from? Uh, Dr. Uh, Daria, about he was talking about his practice in IMG. Um, talked- yes, and yeah. and we also agreed to disagree on some of his valid on uh, some of the points that he was bringing up. So while I appreciate the feedback and I appreciate the fact that there is a dying breed within the United States of private practice, it is a choice, and it's a choice that everyone has to make on their own terms in their own way. It's a wonderful choice. It's a great pack, way of packing medicine. Just make sure it works for you, you know, for everybody. It doesn't, the question is, how do you make it work in terms of staying alive, paying insurance, all that kind of stuff? So oh, Dr. Stein, yeah. in, in an effort to not um, <laughs> digress too far from the topic at hand, <laughs> Trans, trans theoretical model of change. Okay, good. Well, um, good. So once you get the patient into contemplation and you call them back uh, or they've come back to see you, um, you reintroduce the idea. And depending on how willing or interested the conversation is back to you, you can determine whether or not they're in one of these steps, which you basically want to make sure that your patient is in some sort of preparation step um, so that they're they're more willing, they're more pliable, which means you would have had to give them as much information as possible, given them time to think about it for themselves, talk to their own people, talk to their own family, come back with you with questions um, and allow them the opportunity to ask them and give them the 30 seconds or less that it takes to let them ask and you answer. And then re-ask the question. And nine times out of 10, they'll be ready for some sort of action. Um, So these are just some more updates on prevention. Um, Again, the criteria that I stated before in reference to the fact that it's not just for young adults anymore and is now goes up to 45 and the two uh, negative HPV, they're allowed to take it. They're allowed to then get the vaccine after that. So whether or not to choose uh, the nine or four, it just depends. I think right now in the United States, it's only nine. I think four isn't even an option anymore. Um, And all insurances in the United States cover it from Medicaid to Medicare to private insurances. It doesn't cost the patient anything. It's part of the, even if it's outside of the vaccination window, meaning they're over the age of 18, it's still fully covered by their insurance. Mm -hmm. So if the patient continues to say, no, thank you, what do you do? Do you just let it go or do you keep pressing it? What do you guys think? I think you should provide them with as, as much information as you possibly can. Because mm-hmm. you can't make anybody do anything. So just provide them with as much information as you can and let them read it at their leisure and let them make the decision. Right. So you just give them the time. Reintroduce the information you gave to them before. You let them take it home. And then when you see them in a year, guess what? 
they got to get flu shot, uh, COVID shot and everything else all over again, you can bring up the same vaccinations. Yes. So it's sometimes it's just repetitive. Um, I've read a couple of papers that say human behavior takes three times of being asked before they'll just say yes. You're right. Well, it might take you three years, but, or three visits, depending on how often you see that patient. But you might be, you'll, you'll be more successful in um, vaccination compliance. Sure. I appreciate so, your um, exuberance and it makes a lot of sense. I know that when I've been talking to people who do world medicine, go to other countries, their job is training. The, they don't treat the patient. They train other people to, to see the patient, nurse practitioners, you know, men, men in the community to carry the message. And so the issue really is your ideas are fantastic, but how do you get it done? One thing might be to go to the drug company and uh, ask them to pay for an advertising campaign. I mean, how do you get your ideas out there and stay stay alive. That, that's really the only thing I'm saying. Okay. Yeah. Well, one of one of the ways is I'm a professor of health educate health communication. So that that is one way I'm doing it by educating other physicians and nurses yeah. and clinicians yeah. on how to have this conversation. At least every semester for the last two years, mm -hmm. I've been doing that. So there is an actual generation of nurses and PAs that have learned how to make this communication. I've also been working with osmosis for the last three years. And I also have this conversation with doctors around the world having this same conversation. So it's a matter of planting a seed, allowing people to take away what they want and learning, understanding that application isn't overnight. Turnaround doesn't happen tomorrow. It's a matter of understanding that change, especially in a system is cog wheeled and rusty as the medical system is that we work in yep. you have to appreciate the fact that change comes with one person at a time because the way that our educational system for medicine is is that when i become a doctor i'll teach another doctor i'll teach four more doctors those four doctors are going to teach four more doctors so yeah i might not see this communication change tomorrow i might not even see it in my lifetime but I know that they're going to be doctors that talk better to their patients. Well, I would kick you upstairs and make you the CEO of a program that reaches out to everybody. I'm just, I just, I'm just concerned about your time and your income. That, that's really the issue. I mean, I, I love your zeal; it makes a lot of sense. And how do you, you know, how do you make it work? How do you expand your ideas and teach other people it? So I actually am in the process of creating a coalition of African-American physicians that we all went to medical school together. I took a pause to take care of my children and family and my post-traumatic stress after being in a hurricane. But they're all doctors now. And I'm actually working with all of them to create a, a co-op of physicians that will function in New York City, North Carolina, and Tennessee. And I have property in all of those areas. And there's grants in each of those states specifically North Carolina and Tennessee, because they're rural and they're paying doctors to build stuff because they don't have enough facilities. So that's how you create, you, you make a long plan. I've been planning this since my first year of medical school when I was inspired by the notion. So it's not, I appreciate your pessimism, but, and your devil advocate, but please bear in mind, I've been thinking and planning no, okay. and, and plotting for years. <laughs> for it's, not years. it's not pessimism. I think it's a great idea, but the really issue is implementation. You know, and you, you need a full time salary from a foundation to do this. That's all I'm saying. Uh, you know, it's a practice is very difficult. So I'm, I'm just, your ideas are wonderful. How do we get them implemented? You know, one by one in office is one way you could do it. I understand that. Um, but, if you, were, you know, I'm not pessimistic and realistic, okay? I want you Agreed to be and disagree. Okay, oh, of course you do. You always do. Yes. So, yeah. So here are some other reasons why patients will say no is the provider's disposition. Yep. The provider's mannerisms, their personality, their social environment. This is the reason why I always tell 
my fellow medical students, we are not competing because the patients that are going to see me are not the same patients that are going to see you. The patients that like me are not going to like you. It's just one of those things. So also where you're practicing is also going to change certain factors that you have to consider. And then also, you know, community and health behaviors are also going to be influential factors that you need to understand while you're working wherever you're working, whether in a residency program, own practice, macro system practice, you just got to know who your population is and be able to present yourself in a manner that will allow them and you to be able to communicate without a hierarchy in the room because no patient wants to be talked down to or talked at. The best way is to tell people, I gave it to my kids and I feel good about it. The more you can own it yourself, the more successful it'll be with the patient. As you say, it's the attitude. The attitude can't be, you can't make it up. It has to come from yourself. And that's what, what many ways how you convince patients. You know, how does a fat person tell a patient to go on a diet? <laughs> it doesn't work that well. Um, so anything you can do on your personal experience and, and push that will be very helpful. I agree. Absolutely. Um, does then you also avoid lawsuits. Exactly. Because if you have a good relationship with your patient, hey. they're less likely to sue you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hayes. I appreciate you. <laughs> so these are um, some of the uh, counter health marketing strategies that uh, Dr. Stein actually brought up, which is engaging social media. So like just being one of the many doctors on TikTok that is trying to revert the uh, mis misinformation that's been thrown up everywhere. Um, partnering with local schools to create a, a community health program, um, working with other providers to see how they're, you know, that have good vaccination um, uh, good vaccination compliance. What are they doing? What's so different? Um, there's also a lot of uh, offices, especially in the macro system based offices, they have these TVs that run loops of like different health videos and you can work with um, different health uh, producers and create a video of your own. Um, but these are, and then wait, the most important part is let the patient come to you as well. Give them time. Time is not, you know, for this particular vaccine, time is not the problem. For others, time is the problem. So a lot of follow-up needs to be done. Um, so here are some other uh, countermeasures for anti-vaccination. -vac so people worry about the autism, the environmental factors. Is this really gonna increase my risk of getting anything? Um, is it really going to protect me? You know, you're saying that there's this and, you know, so sometimes throwing too many words at the patient or too many numbers and too many descriptions will lead to them not really understanding anything at all and just uh, pushing away. So again, going back to making sure you're speaking with them, not at them or above them. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, this is a repeat slide. Okay, so that was that was everything. Um, these are my references. Do you guys have any other questions? No, thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. I like the interaction. Yeah. I, I yeah, I prefer not to just